information. Should you choose to accept it. It's a quest. It's a quest for fun. Well, The Rock says, why don't we just cut right to the chase? Okay, now he, uh, you know, he wants to get together. Well, you know, he wants to talk. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. It's showtime, folks! What are you? I'm... Greetings and salutations. Welcome to And I Quote, the weekly show where we introduce you to content creators of all shapes and sizes that join us from any and all corners of the nerd universe. We find out more about them and we take your questions. I am your host, Ryan of Neuroculture, and our guest this week, oh my goodness gracious, this is an incredible person. She is an archivist, a film historian, a blogger, a writer, and we're going to talk a little bit more about something known as the golden age of Hollywood. Please welcome Annette Bohenick to the show. Annette, welcome to the program. How are you? Doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we are so grateful that you are here with us. And if you have any questions for Annette during any portion of this show, let us know in the live chat. Let us know in the comments. Our producers are going to be monitoring it as you go throughout the course of the day. So to kick things off here, I want you to imagine yourself stepping inside a time-traveling DeLorean going 88 miles per hour and seeing some serious stuff. So Annette, what were some of your favorite movies growing up? Ooh, well, there were, there were quite a few. I think uh, really my, my top favorite growing up was The Wizard of Oz. I think that just growing up as a little girl, I wanted to be Dorothy and had a lot of fond memories uh, about watching that with my grandparents, uh, looking forward to the annual broadcast there, and uh, just having fun orchestrating uh, like little live renditions of the show too with some of my, my friends uh, over the summer as well. So a lot of fun memories in relation to that film. Of course, I watched a lot of Disney, a lot of musicals, as well. Uh, so I think, yeah, it was kind of a combination of um, a lot of those and a lot of early comedy too, I have to mention. Um, if you remember Blockbuster video, my dad would uh, go to Blockbuster <laughs> quite a bit and uh, rent yeah. out like these old uh, comedies, whether there were uh, Laurel and Hardy, The Three Stooges, uh, The Little Rascals. And I really enjoyed those uh, so much so that it got to the point where I figured that anything like black and white was going to be really good and really exciting. Ooh, amazing, amazing. Now, you mentioned a few of them. Are there any uh, titles that you would say were some of your favorite TV series growing up? Or were you more of a movie go movie goer than a TV series watcher? Definitely television, too. Uh, as far as like some of the classic things went, there was a lot of classic television, uh, like classic television sitcoms from uh, decades ago that I felt uh, still were, were fun and, and engaging and almost seemed cartoonish in nature. So shows like I Dream of Jeannie, Bewitched, uh, I, I loved Gilligan's Island as well. Uh, so shows like that that I think were a lot of fun. They were fantastic, uh, colorful, too, uh, given when, when they transitioned from black and white to color. Uh, but uh, some of the plots were essentially kind of cartoonish as well and uh, sort of fantastic and uh, really, I think, fit the bill for uh, entertainment that I was looking for as a child and even on through to my teens. Mm, okay. All right. All right. Good picks there. Go. Pi uh, excuse me. Good picks there, I should say. No, no question about it. Now, I want you and the person, you who are watching or listening to this to think about this for just, just a moment here. There's something known as the golden age of Hollywood. Now, when you hear that, and for you who may be watching or listening to this, I want you to take a moment and think about it because we're going to dive into what exactly is the golden age of Hollywood and how it made its own mark in history and things of that nature. But first, I would like for Annette and for you to take a look at this. This may illustrate a little bit more of what we're going to be talking about here in just a moment. So take a look. <laughs> I've got the falcon. You may have the falcon, but we certainly have you. I just want to let them know that they didn't break me. And be on time. I haven't got a decent watch. Steal one. Watchers, I don't have to show you any stinking watches. Who is this Mongo anyway? Dynamite there, bud. I need the old Blade Runner. I need your magic. What 
What is it? The uh, stuff that dreams are made of. My goodness. What a trip down memory lane that may have been for you there, Annette, and maybe even for you who may be watching this. And like I said, we're talking about Annette Bohenick, archivist, film historian, and writer. Make sure you're sharing this video with all 200 of your closest friends. You're going to like the way they look watching this video, I guarantee it. So the golden age of Hollywood, Annette, what exactly is that? Well, it's uh, it's roughly the period from about like the, the early years of movie making, particularly the silent era. So if we think of like the 1900s or so, or even advance it as far as uh, the 1910s and 20s, uh, and uh, maybe ended at about 1960. So roughly that period for movie making for Hollywood is considered to be very, very special for, for several different reasons. Uh, one being that the, the film studios functioned in a way that was very, very different than the way filmmaking operates today. Uh, we had these major studios like MGM, Warner Brothers, etc., working under the studio system, where the goal was to really uh, produce films from beginning to end, and even on through distribution of the films uh, entirely in-house. So all of the on and off screen talent that you can imagine that would be involved in the filmmaking process would all be at the studio's disposal uh, to turn out these films. So uh, in, in particular with the, the actors and actresses that were under contract, there was very little autonomy. The studio had a lot of say in terms of what work they were doing uh, for the studio, what they were doing outside of the studio as well in some cases. So uh, that is one factor that I think uh, makes that golden age of Hollywood period so different. But also, I think another thing about this is that uh, movie making uh, is just never going to be the same as it was in this era. Uh, truly, they were like star machines. They would um, take someone they, they discovered, they would uh, really, I think, uh, adapt them to what, what they thought was star quality and start to star them in films that they felt this person would really work well in and who they'd work best alongside and uh, hopefully they'd be met with success as, as a result. But uh, even so, even so that era certainly has a lot of pros, a lot of cons. I think one of the really great things is that there's still so much to be discussed about that period, even though it's been decades later, it's been over a century in the case of the, the age of some of these films and uh, cases when some of these stars were, were on the screen at last. But again, people are still talking about this, people are still studying them. And that's just the on-screen stuff. Certainly the, the off-screen talents are also being studied and discussed. They're influencing artists today. And uh, certainly they're continuing to uh, entertain audiences from all over the world at this point and clearly across different generations since we're still talking about it in 2022 to an extent. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And some of those things we saw in that clip there, I actually went to the theater and those were some of the, those classic films. That was my first time seeing them on a big screen. And there's really, there's not many things that can match that. Watching To Catch a Thief, watching The Maltese Falcon, seriously, that's one of the best, that's probably the best way to watch certain classic films. But mm -hmm. my goodness gracious, it seems like, and, and you and you brought this up where they, where they find actors, they find actresses, they sign them to deals, and then they just star in so many movies. And they keep chugging mm -hmm. them out too. Like they were filming, it was almost like a conveyor belt that just kept going, right? They just, they were turning out movies one after the other. They were filming like several films on the course of like months, if not a year, just so they can make them to the theater, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And if you look at uh, the cases, especially I think in the 1930s, they're especially guilty of really like churning them out because that was the great escape for moviegoers at the time who were dealing with the depression just mm. for um, that, that low ticket cost. They could just check their troubles at the door and at least immerse themselves in a fantasy uh, for a few hours or um, however long they, they spent in the theater. But yeah, as is the case with some of those like early musicals, like the 1930s Warner Brothers, like uh, films like Gold Diggers or uh, 42nd Street, Footlight Parade, uh, etc. Films like that, you might even notice that they tend to star the same core cast members and the same like supporting cast members as well. Uh, and uh, one after another, it would be like uh, yet another film that would come out that would be loosely similar in plot, but uh, also you'd see a lot of the same uh, individuals uh, that are part of the cast portraying characters that might have different names, but at its core, the story is pretty similar. And uh, that formula, once they, they saw something that worked, they would use it and use it and use it over and over again. So um, that's something that's noticeable. But yeah, in the case too of some of these actors, whether they were really big name actors or character actors, if you look at their filmographies, like on IMDb or something, it's phenomenal 
went all the scroll, scroll, scroll and see how many films that they were a part of in just a year alone. So very different than it is today. Mm, I, I would say so. And by the way, you spoke about how you went to Blockbuster to check out some of Terry MacGyver mm -hmm. chimes in. What's up, Terry? He says, we didn't have Blockbuster over in Northern Ireland where I am. Our version was something known as Extra Vision. A weekly visit was always an adventure. <laughs> it was yeah well yeah that's interesting i have not heard of extra vision before but yes yeah i mean i still vividly remember blockbuster and yeah it was an adventure and i think once all that closed my my next best thing was the local library really that was still at that point stocked with vhs and lots of classic films and the dvds and so i can't get a vhs there anymore but it was kind of the, the next best thing uh for me and it was free on top of that so even better and more appealing <laughs> Yeah, that is very true. That's very true. Philip Miller chimes in. He says, hello, Ryan, and hello, Dr. Annette Bohenick. Thanks for being here today on the Nerd Culture uh, channel. I just ha I just love the classic films by Vincent Price, such as Comedy of Terrors and House on Haunted Hill. As far as classic television is concerned, have you ever watched The Saint with Sir Roger Moore? Oh, I have not seen that one, but I am always here for recommendations, so I will definitely add that to my, my movie list. Hmm, interesting. Thank you for bringing that up, Philip. We do appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. We really do I appreciate it. we cannot do this without you. Now, certain things that you've taken part in, some things that you've written. Oh, well, before I actually get to that, you have a relationship with something known as TCM, Turner Classic Movies. What have you, what have you done for them in the past? And do you have anything planned for the future in terms of uh, collaborating with TCM? Yeah, so I mean, initially, I was just a fan. This is like this dates back to back when my family got cable television when I was like nine years old. I, uh, I mentioned I had that obsession with The Wizard of Oz. And uh, one day I was just like scrolling through channels to see what on earth we had access to now. And I stumbled across TCM. And uh, they were airing the film Strike Up the Band from mm -hmm. 1940, I believe. And uh, it just blew my mind that uh, Judy Garland had done something besides play Dorothy. This was one of her collaborations with Mickey Rooney. So I felt like I stumbled across a treasure trove of films uh, that I had not seen that showcased her talents and all of her work. Uh, and that that's largely uh, due to TCM. And uh, that that moment kind of serendipitously prompted me to go explore her filmography further, go to the local library, check out everything Judy Garland. And then through watching her films, I learned about all the really other talents from that era and got exposed to others like uh, Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, et cetera. Uh, so that's kind of how it all started uh, for TCM with me. And I've like faithfully been a fan and really haven't turned off <laughs> that channel since, honestly. Uh, but uh, in, gosh, I think the the 2010s or so, uh, TCM started this uh, membership club called TCM Backlot that mm -hmm. gave the chance for fans to really start to engage with the network. So uh, things like uh, starting a local chapter. So I, I helped uh, create Chicago's uh, local chapter of classic film fans, uh, which was a lot of fun and still exists today. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, there would be things like uh, contests, book giveaways, poster giveaways. And uh, one of the, the really cool parts of that was to be able to introduce a film on the air or to, um, to tour the studio. So um, I was one of the lucky people who got to introduce a film on the air. Um, they were looking for people who had like a fun story and connection to a particular classic film that um, we could talk about. They would screen and then we'd do some closing uh, chatter about it. So uh, I pitched the film Theodora Goes Wild uh, that stars Irene Dunn and Melvin Douglas. It's a comedy, not many people have heard of it, but it was it was her first foray into comedy uh, for Irene Dunn. And uh, it's, it's a really exceptional film. I think it, it ages really well too. Um, it's mm -hmm. about um, Irene playing this, uh, this woman who lives in a, a small town. Um, she's a pretty low profile person, but they don't know she has this whole secret life where she's an author and she's writing the scandalous novel that like everyone in the town has issue with, uh, takes issue with. So that's kind of the, the key plot there, chaos and comedy ensue. And so I got to uh, introduce that film uh, for TCM. So really cool to be able to uh, to chat with uh, Ben Mankiewicz, the TCM uh, host uh, for, for that uh, screening. And the following year, um, I submitted myself to uh, one of their giveaways ways to get a tour of the TCM studio and they were historically like a closed set so I was on that inaugural first group of fans who got to uh, to take the tour to watch um, Ben do some uh, some filming for his intros and outros for films as well uh, and spend some time with uh, the different uh, TCM 
uh, technicians and people who work there as well as the, the hosts. So um, that was um, some of the early involvement. And I had had this um, Hometowns to Hollywood blog uh, for quite some time that um, I had been working on that uh, documents my trips to the hometowns of classic film stars. And uh, in chatting with TCM, I wondered if there was a way that we could collaborate in some capacity. And they were looking for content at that point for their TCM Backlot website, uh, in particular, like written content that fans could look into and read and to sort of uh, make that membership like all the more special, give them more access to additional uh, creative output, like writing videos, etc. And so I was able to uh, write for TCM uh, for the duration of TCM Backlot, as well as a monthly columnist under the, the Hometowns to Hollywood column. Uh, so yeah, since then, TCM Backlot has ended, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, a lot of things have changed in terms of how TCM operates and, and who owns TCM and what their, their vision uh, is looking like at this point. But uh, my relationship with them continues. I'm still very much in touch with everyone I was in touch with before that. And uh, I still regularly attend the TCM film festivals. And at this point, I offer up a media coverage for the festival. So uh, I'll be there come the end of April and continuing to cover all things TCM uh, at the festival uh, next month. Wow. That is incredible. That is simply incredible. Once again, we're talking with the incredible Annette Bohenik here on And I Quote. Make sure you're sharing this video with all 400 of your closest friends. They're going to like the way they look after watching this video. I guarantee it. If you have any questions for Annette, please let us know in the comments. Let us know in the live chat. We're going to be monitoring as we go throughout the course of the day. My goodness gracious, how are your conversations with uh, Ben Mankiewicz? How is he? Is he a cool guy? Is he cool? Is yeah. he? Is he you know, is he really, you know, calm, cool and collected as he appears on screen, always presenting himself during those intros and outros when the movies are being shown in theaters? He, he really is. He's he's very kind. Um, and uh, I think he's very down to earth as well. He clearly looks like he has it all together on screen, which is wonderful. And he's just uh, as, as in control of himself off screen as well. Uh, but he's uh, certainly very, very approachable. I find that he, he always has time for uh, for the people who are fans of TCM or uh, interested in classic Hollywood as well. So like even so, as is the case with the, the TCM film festivals, um, he's being approached constantly by people and he always takes time to chat with every single person who comes his way and will pose for pictures. So um, that's a really uh, great thing. I think that he's um, so involved in uh, the network as well as um, being such an excellent ambassador for it. Uh, now, with that being said too, uh, I think uh, it's also um, so much fun to see him at work. When I did that uh, very first uh, TCM tour uh, and mm -hmm. was able to watch him do some filming, uh, he was filming uh, intros and outros for um, what was going to be the star of the month footage. I think that oh. day he was recording uh, intros for Esther Williams films. Mm -hmm. uh, and we watched him uh, nail introductions and outroduction, or out outros rather, outroductions. Um, but uh, also uh, he did uh, have moments where he like stumbled upon his words too. So it was like really fun to see um, kind of how he got past that and how he worked through uh, some of those uh, moments where like he had to maybe like revise the writing or like tweak his presentation style a bit and just watch him at work uh, on his feet. And uh, in addition, I think uh, one one of my favorite moments too from that TCM tour was uh, after all the uh, the recordings were, were finished for the intros and outros, we all had like a lunch together. And uh, Ben, you know, if you, you've seen him on the air, he's in his nice like suit and um, all ready to go uh, for the camera. Uh, and he showed up for lunch, like still in the suit, but like with a hoodie over it, just like sat down with us and uh, and had lunch and just been uh, <laughs> just mm. entirely casual and uh, again, uh, comfortable and, and very kind and approachable throughout. Uh, so it's been a delight to, to be able to work with him. And since then um, I've met all of the uh, the current TCM hosts uh, mm -hmm. at this point. They're, they're all such mm -hmm. a lovely bunch. And um, certainly uh, in my heart, I really miss Robert Osborne born of course like he's my my first like really my first exposure to TCM and was uh, certainly a familiar face on my television for so long but um i think uh in in his wake it's it's been uh it's been hard for i think uh fans to uh entirely like embrace one particular host especially when it was like right after his passing but i think a really great thing now is that TCM has this um this abundance of different hosts who specialize in sort of different areas and genres of film as well uh, and so we get Get sort of this like little taste of everything and have such a fun like collaborative team uh, right now for TCM and I think they're carrying on uh, Robert's legacy so well uh, and clearly they're, they're doing something right. Mm. 
That is amazing. I'm, uh, very, you know, you that is incredible. You've had this opportunity to meet so many wonderful people and have conversations with them, do behind the scenes stuff, and then do things in front of the camera, behind the camera, write all these wonderful things. That is just incredible. Terry, Terry MacGyver chimes in. He says the TCM film library is really, it's something else. Wall to wall gems. He says, yeah, it's a rarity uh, to find something like that. I mean, they are still, they've, they've gone through several changes, but uh, they're still very proudly, uh, you know, uh, no cuts, commercial free and showing uh, the classics. Now, uh, in terms of classics, uh, they they still do, I think, um, films from several different decades, and, and they're still pretty true to like what at least my definition of, of classic or golden age is um, from silent films. They're about 1960. And they still have these moments where um, they'll show films from well beyond 1960 that are part of um, other types of programming. So, for example, if they're doing Star of the Month and they have a star who has had a really lengthy career, they'll show classics, but they'll also show like contemporary films that are still showcasing this great classic film star. Uh, and as is the case with them um, right now, we're in the thick of the Oscar programming on TCM. And uh, mm. there's so much you can do with Oscar programming, whether it's um, celebrating the wins or celebrating best pictures or um, the, the notorious upsets as well. You have just decades worth of Oscar history. So that's also a nice time where you'll see a blend for, of these older films and slightly more contemporary films as well on the network. Uh, and uh, inevitably, I, I know I always learn something uh, during these programs because um, if I'm watching TV, like usually it'll be my, my old classic films. But when TCM does programming like this, that um, kind of challenges me to like look beyond certain eras or decades in filmmaking. Uh, it's always rewarding. And, and I always come away with something that, that I didn't know before. Hmm. Yep. That is very true. Very true. And Philip Miller chimes in. He says, apparently at Vince's Price's old home in Hollywood, apparently, there is a movie room that still has the old 35 millimeter reels. Have you actually seen that room, Annette? Oh, wow. No, um, I have yet to cover Vincent Price for Hometowns to Hollywood. So I will have to <laughs> have to definitely do that probably um, closer to, to Halloween time since that's I think his, his shining season there. Uh, but that that is great. Um, I do love uh, hearing stories from like old uh, celebrities and, and their former homes and seeing what their, their screening rooms used to look like. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, uh, Phil. We really do appreciate it. Now you've contributed to a couple of, um, a number of things over the years. I just want to bring some things up here for you, Annette. So this one here, underseen and underrated. You got your name in there. I'm just wondering what exactly did you contribute to, uh, contribute to this book? And in your mind, what do you feel is one film that you feel is underseen or underrated? Ooh, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember. So uh, with that ebook, so that ebook is done as part of a uh, an organization that I'm part of called Classic uh, Movie Bloggers Association. So it's um, sort of like a conglomerate of um, different bloggers out there who specialize in writing about classic film in some capacity. And it could be something like pretty broad uh, as just classic films in general, or something specific, like maybe uh, someone who blogs about a particular author or maybe uh, a particular uh, year in Hollywood, or as is my niche, uh, the, the hometowns of classic film stars. So um, I'm part of that, but uh, we do offer up a uh, spring and fall blogathon. And um, with uh, that, uh, those blogathons, uh, there is usually uh, at the end of the blogathon the opportunity to contribute to um, some sort of an ebook iteration. We haven't done it for every single blogathon we've done, uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, there there are quite a few um, quite a few um, ebooks out there that exist uh, because of that. Uh, so, underseen and underrated was an old blogathon. I'm trying to remember. I think it was um, spring 2017. We did that one, and uh, the different members that are part of this blog association were encouraged to contribute an article about a particular film that they thought was underseen or underrated. Uh, so my contribution to that one uh, is a chapter about a film called The Tales of Hoffman from 1951. Uh, mm -hmm. So that one, uh, if you're not familiar, it stars uh, the uh, ballerina slash actress Maura Shearer. You may know her from The Red Shoes. Uh, so uh. she's um, the, the redhead there. She plays Victoria Page in the film. But this is another film she did called Tales of Hoffman, where it's sort of um, a series of vignettes about um, uh, 
this uh, this this man who is uh, in love with this woman, played by uh, by Maura Shearer throughout the film, and uh, it's just uh, just different um, imaginings and uh, featured dances that um, feature her in different like dance type roles. And um, there's a lot of creativity and uh, really uh, creative approaches in terms of how some of these dances are orchestrated and choreographed and how they're visually. Uh, portrayed as well. So I think that's that's sort of a visual gem for me, much like Red Shoes is, but just doesn't get the attention that the Red Shoes gets. Hmm. Okay. All right. I'm going to have to add a lot of the, I'm hearing a lot of titles here, so I may have to, I'm going to, to <laughs> Yeah, right. These. Yeah. We're going to have to go back and just take notes, right? I'm going to have to, yes, exactly. I'm going to have to go back, take notes, write this stuff down, because I know a good friend of mine, Jerome Connor. Jerome, I dropped your name, buddy. I had to do it because Jerome is a good friend of mine, and he is a big, 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 big film buff, loves all the stuff that took place during the golden age of Hollywood, everything. I think this man has seen every single movie that's ever been made. This is how ridiculously smart that Jerome is. If you ever get a chance to uh, meet him, whether it be in person or virtual, mm -hmm. I strongly recommend it. He does a show with him and his uh, co-host called Saturday morning cartoons, where they take a look back at the old school Saturday morning cartoons oh, of different okay. decades and different eras and things like that, which you can find. And that on the HWWS web TV, YouTube channel. So you may want to treat yourself. Absolutely. I'm going to write this one down. So I'm just, hey, we're exchanging notes for notes here, folks. <laughs> but still, something else you contributed to, something that deals with, I believe it's film noir, femme fatale, something like yeah. that. So what was your contribution uh, here? Okay, yeah. So that one, we have a lot of noir fans uh, in our, our group uh, for uh, CMBA, Classic Movie Bloggers Association. Uh, they're, they're called Noiristas, by the way. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know there I was, was a term aware. for that. Yeah. I was not aware of that. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, gosh. And uh, as far as that one goes, so yeah, so um, the bloggers were uh, encouraged to contribute an article about uh, the, the femme or homme fatale. So um, we're used to hearing the term femme fatale in uh, film noirs where there's historically like this gorgeous like female character who's sort of uh, some in some cases responsible for the, the downfall of the story's protagonist or just um, symbolizes like a sort of an obstacle on the protagonist's journey. Uh, and then the, the homme fatale is um, the male equivalent, basically, of that. When there's a female protagonist, then we see the male who is um, responsible for, um, for that uh, part of the story. So um, for that one, I focused on the, uh, the film Leave Her to Heaven. Uh, that stars Jean Tierney as the femme fatale in that role. Um, Jean Crane mm -hmm. is also there. And uh, it interestingly, uh, we have the, the main character falls in love with Jean Crane, or Jean uh, Tierney's character rather. <laughs> and uh, she uh, she presents herself as like gorgeous, like um, you fall in love with her at the, the beginning of the film. But as the story goes on, you see how incredibly evil and cold she is as the story progresses. Uh, so she's very cold and callous along the way. Uh, but so she's uh, my, my contribution. Oh, man, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm a fan of, you know, film noir myself. I don't know if the Maltese Falcon exactly falls into that realm. I mean, it might. And then there's a few others such as, sure. you know, I mean, mm, has certain elements to it to catch a thief because, you know, it's like yeah. a cat and mouse game. So that's kind of that's kind of cool. There's a Kiss Me Deadly. I believe is another one. Okay. So yeah, those are some of the movies that stick out to me as a bit of a film noir. But listen, if you got any more titles, I should be you know checking out at ASAP. Please feel free to let us know either verbally or hey, if you got something you you feel you're a fan of that come when it comes down to film noir, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are on certain genres of film and some of your favorites as well. We love the interaction. We'd love to hear from you. So drop it, you know, drop it like it's hot in the comments, if you will. I'm sorry, that's a lot of words. Uh, <laughs> G. Willikers. Terry MacGyver chimes in. Uh, he says that Jerome Connor's movie knowledge is absolutely second to none, Annette. All right. Mm. <laughs> mm. Interesting things happening, folks. So that kind of leads us in. You've brought this up a number of times, so let's let's get down to brass taxes. Something known as Hometowns to Hollywood. What exactly is it, and what is the origin story to Hometowns to Hollywood? Yeah, so Hometowns to Hollywood is the name of a travel blog or a travel website that I started back in 2013. And it stems from this love I have of classic film. And I got the idea for it uh, when, gosh, I think I, I was an undergrad at the time. And uh, for fun, I would uh, go about uh, traveling uh, to just different uh, points of interest uh, where I was going to school. So at the time, I was going to Butler University in Indianapolis. Oh. And uh, I 
I would see kind of what else was relatively close to me in the area. And uh, I was able to visit James Dean's hometown, which was um, just a not a terrible drive uh, north of where Butler was located. And uh, it was really interesting just to see uh, where um, where he was born and raised. Uh, there were at least two museums uh, in his honor. There's a historical society and then there's um, sort of like a fan led at James Dean Museum slash gallery that has a lot of personal effects and memorabilia, as is the case for the Historical Society. He's also buried out there. And so um, it really intrigued me uh, to have this access to classic Hollywood history in Indiana. And uh, I started to try to orchestrate and schedule more trips that were sort of local to um, where I was going to school or where I was from that would also kind of uh, check uh, it kind of uh, fulfill my interests uh, in terms of classic Hollywood. So um, I'm from Mount Prospect, Illinois, so near the Chicago land area, and about a 40-ish minute drive away from that is Waukegan, Illinois, the hometown of Jack Benny. And uh, I also did a trip up there to see his statue, his childhood home, the Jack Benny Performing Arts Center at 39 Jack Benny Drive. So uh, there are a lot of like fun uh, tributes that I was finding along the way uh, for these um, these old time movie stars, and I think. Like the real epiphany I had was uh, in uh, 2013, finally, uh, I wound up uh, being in grad school at that point and was traveling uh, presenting like the, the papers I was working on in uh, just different towns um, throughout the US. And there was one particular conference I did in Augusta, Georgia. And mm -hmm. I was staying at a hotel and I went down to the hotel lobby to see the different like brochures for what else was around me that I could visit while I was around. And the brochure for the uh, the Laurel and Hardy Museum caught my eye. And I thought, well, there's a whole museum dedicated uh, to these people. And uh, I, I did wind up um, hiring a cab and going out to this museum. Um, and their story just interested me so much in terms of like how they came to be. Uh, the, the Oliver Hardy uh, Museum or Laurel and Hardy Museum rather is located in Harlem, Georgia. So not, not too far from Augusta. And uh, their, their origin story was that uh, Harlem was the hometown of Oliver Hardy and people were uh, proud of him for having come from there and just uh, made good uh, in his own way. And um, even uh, years after his passing, people would start just sending Laurel and Hardy memorabilia to Harlem, Georgia's post office, um, so much so that the post office started to amass this collection and started to just display things. It didn't take long before the post office was just overrun with stuff, <laughs> like in, uh, in relation to Laurel and Hardy, that they, uh, they wound up moving the entire collection and creating in uh, a Laurel and Hardy museum as a result. And so um, I thought that was really cool to see that legacy continue to be celebrated years later. While I was visiting, um, there were adults there, seniors there. And then at one point there was a total school bus of children that showed up in the afternoon and all these kids like ran into the museum. Like, what's this? Now, so it turns out the museum bakes cookies every afternoon. So they get their after school snack, but then they all go to the Laurel and Hardy screening room and they watch Laurel and Hardy shorts and eat their cookies. So I thought that was such a cool way to uh, not only celebrate uh, the legacy for Laurel and Hardy, but to also kind of make that uh, museum and that tribute relevant and useful to the community as well, just seeing all people from uh, different age groups and from really all over the map gathering here and celebrating uh, the legacy from uh, these two major comics from uh, so long ago. So really at that moment, I decided, well, well, I have like at least three trips under my belt that I could write about at this point. I've been photographing like a nut at this point as well. <laughs> Might as well post all this somewhere. Uh, and the blog was born. And uh, that was kind of the, the initial idea was that it would just chronicle and um, act as sort of like a time capsule for my, my trips to the different hometowns of these classic film stars. And uh, it was a really nice, I think, niche for me to uh, to explore and to contribute in terms of um, what, what I have to share in terms of classic film, because there, there are a lot of us classic film fans out there. But once you find your special sort of like area uh, in which like you can really like grow and flourish in that area and contribute that to the larger discussion, I think it's a really great thing. It's, it's really exciting. And since those first like 
two, three trips of the blog has grown substantially. I have like over 150 plus of these celebrity profiles that are um, out there and available to be accessed on Hometowns to Hollywood. Um, so some actors are remembered better than others, but, <laughs> and some um, some remembered more fondly than others as I see, but it's, it's so interesting, I think, uh, to see what the tributes look like now, um, how these individuals are still being celebrated in their hometowns and beyond, uh, whether it's museums, childhood homes, full-on film festivals, or in some cases, there's not a whole lot um, that honors them either. So uh, the, that's the mission for the blog, is to um, focus on their legacies and the stories from sort of before they came to Hollywood. Oh my goodness gracious. Mm, puts a smile on my face. And if you haven't heard about this blog, definitely check it out. Links to where you can find all this stuff are located within the description of this video. So treat yourself. Learn your history, because in the words of Biff Tannen, you know your history. Very good. I mean, you know, nothing, nothing wrong with learning the history. Now, what would you say are some of the uh, biggest rewards about being a blogger? Yeah, I think, well, uh, in terms of the blogging, uh, so I, I really like to travel. So it was a great way to blend uh, these interests that I have for classic film and, as well as traveling uh, and to uh, really make something uh, of those two big interests. But one of the most rewarding aspects of it, I think, is just building relationships along the way, um, whether it's uh, building relationships with fellow fans, um, in some cases, like family members even um, have reached out to me uh, about these different stars that I've profiled uh, and also like museum curators as well. Uh, it's always so much fun to uh, to get to know someone else who sort of like speaks the language and is also interested uh, in classic cinema or uh, in a particular star. So for me, uh, far and away, I think that's uh, really the, the greatest thing is of all the people that I've gotten to know as a result of this and all the people that I've gotten to connect with as well. Um, had I not started the blog, um, I would not have started my Hometowns to Hollywood presentation series or if um, written the book that I did. And I wouldn't be on this podcast either because I got to know you through um, through you attending one of my presentations as well. So um, I'm forever grateful um, for that, for that capacity to connect with um, other people um, from, from my area and from well beyond that. I know that the pandemic has had its its issues too, but with these virtual presentations too, I've been able to, to connect with um, a lot more people as well and present geographically uh, farther out uh, than, than I was um, able to present before with uh, the constraints of travel. Oh, absolutely. And I've actually attended more than one of your virtual programs. And uh, let me just yes. say for the record, oh, yeah. I've attended many of them. And my goodness gracious, I get something new, something fresh out of every right. single one. Even if I know a bit about the actor or actress or I've seen that movie before, to hear some of the behind the scenes stories and learn more about what it took to put certain films together or mm -hmm. what it took to get certain cast members together. Because, you know, certain people have certain numbers that they want in their contracts. Certain actresses will only work with... Uh, a certain uh, team or a creative force that mm -hmm. have been in Hollywood for a number of years. So it really depends on who you ask and which actor or actress you're researching because everybody has a different attitude and a different story about each of their projects that they have worked on throughout the course of their respective careers. There's no doubt about it. And I, my goodness, I just, I, I love it. It kind of, you, in, in my opinion, and now people may feel differently about this, but you define the phrase that we need to respect our past so that we can embrace our future because you are just digging, 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 digging into that past. I mean, my goodness gracious. I feel like you got one of the biggest shovels and you're just, what else can I find down this hole? Like you are just ensconced in Hollywood history and I dig it. I wish there were more individuals such as yourself that, you know, granted, I had some good professors in my college years. Don't get me wrong because I took a number of film courses. Don't get me wrong, but I wish there were more, you know, people who had as much passion as you. Oh, I, I appreciate it. And, and we're out there. They, they are. I, like I said, I'm, I'm in a phenomenal group of bloggers. Um, there's that classic movie blog association. If you mm. scroll through the membership, I'm sure you'll find uh, other bloggers and uh, people who are equally uh, as passionate as I am uh, about this. And uh, and yeah, as far as the classic film community goes, I think I'm I'm also one of many who are, who are deeply uh, passionate about this era as well. Uh, one of my favorite, actually, uh, online con contributions that I've been uh, been able to be a part of is uh, my, 
my dear friend Carrie Bible. Uh, she is a tour guide for Hollywood Forever Cemetery, but uh, and she's also a, a huge classic film fan. And during the, the uh, early days of the pandemic and quarantine, she had this awesome idea to uh, start recreating the recipes of classic film stars uh, as she would find them in like old magazines and cookbooks. Again, with a grain of salt, like some of these are purely like publicity, but in other cases, some of these stars actually like really cooked and enjoyed doing so. Uh, and so she uh, started this web series called Hollywood Kitchen, uh, where she would invite different guests to uh, come on and talk about a certain star while also like recreating the, the recipe that was in print. Uh, so I think uh, that's been such a fun tribute. I've been able to uh, be a guest on uh, quite a few of those. Uh, we've done Janet Gaynor's Pumpkin Pie. We did uh, Don Wells when, when she passed away uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we did her, uh, I think it was the, the coconut cream pie, I believe, uh, one of her cream pies. And uh, the, uh, gosh, um, so many others. Uh, Vincent Price was mentioned. I was, uh, th there was an episode we did about different guacamole episodes. Vincent Price's versus Boris Karloff's was one of them. Uh, oh, he's boy. a big cook. There's a whole Vincent Price cookbook out there as well at this point. Oh, yeah. And, um, hmm. Gosh, uh, yeah, so so stuff like that has been a lot of fun. One of the highlights, I think, was actually November of 2021. I was invited to go do an in-person one with her with um, Curly Howard. So Curly of the Three Stooges, his grandson, Bradley Server, is really into preserving his grandfather's legacy. So um, we did mm -hmm. an episode where we did um, the... Three Stooges uh, cookbooks recipe for nyuk nyuk nyams. So it was a yam <laughs> recipe. And at the end, I had the the deep prestigious honor of taking a cream pie <laughs> and slamming it into Bradley Server's face. So oh, all no. my dreams. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious, man. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Once again, we're talking mm -hmm. with uh, film archivist, uh, blogger, writer, film historian, Annette Bohenik here on And I Quote. Make sure you're sharing this video with all 700 of her closest friends. They're going to like the way they look after watching this video, I guarantee it. If you have any questions for Annette, any thoughts, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the live chat. We appreciate all the interactions we've received so far. I mean, you guys are just doing an incredible job over there in the chat. Also, on the flip side of things, though, uh, Annette, for, for blogging or maybe even writing, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges about blogging? Yeah, well, I think uh, with with blogging, um, it's it, for me, it's it's trying to get uh, get into a routine. I, I have a backlog, certainly, of a lot of different hometowns I've visited. So my goal is to usually have something out at least like once or twice a month to have some sort of a new profile out on the website. Um, but uh, as far as the the, uh, the actual like writing goes, with the points of interest that are included in the article, I think um, one of the the hard parts is um, just it, it depends on who it is I'm covering. Like I said, some of these individuals are memorialized and there are lots of tributes to them uh, along the way. And in some cases, some of these stars are are, are not remembered as, as well. And there's not a whole lot to see. So it's often uh, pretty depressing when I go uh, and, and start to like look at old records through um, libraries or through ancestry even um, or historical societies and start looking for like where they grew up. And then I find like, oh, oh, and the home was raised in like this year. So that's not an option anymore. Or in some cases, um, I find uh, where they're buried and they, they don't have a marker in some cases. And sometimes there's headaches in trying to get a marker for them too and to kind of get at least the most basic of tributes out there. Um, for them. So uh, I think it's it's frustrating for me sometimes to run into moments where, again, there's not a whole lot uh, that, that remains in relation to like just physical tributes that, that are still out there aside from their, their filmographies. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, there are moments where there are stars that are remembered very very uh very well and uh, as a result that's it's a lot to write there are a lot of points of interest that you want to make sure that you include um especially with these like really big name stars uh, as well since uh some of these are really big stars like uh, frank sinatra for example or mary pickford uh, they were so impactful that there are tributes to them all over the world really and um there, there are cases where i'm still finding uh, additional ones that i've missed uh, as is the case for i think more recently i had a little discovery with orson wells i found out that um one of his uh, towns that he grew up in just put uh, put up a new statue <laughs> celebrating him. So I'm like, oh, I have to go back and <laughs> add that in. 
So, um, which is exciting though. It's just a, it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, and, and at this point where I've amassed so many articles, now I'm at the part where I'm starting to go back and kind of backtrack and see what still exists, um, what, uh, what new tributes might still be out there at this point. Um, in fact, I had a really depressing one with um, Dick Powell. He's like one of my favorite actors. He was in mm -hmm. musicals and noirs uh, and his, his, um, birthplace actually was um, still standing for a long time. It was really run down. It was raised during the pandemic. And so that that is no more. It was leveled and it made room for like a pizza restaurant. There, there's, there was a plaque, there was a bulletin board with his photos and like stories about him. None of that's there anymore. And I, I cannot get an answer as to where any of that stuff is. Maybe it's gone forever. Maybe he's being celebrated in other ways, but really stinks to see something like that that lasted for as long as it did to just go away entirely. Oh my goodness. You know, when I think of Orson Welles, I know we all think of Rosebud. Rose but Bud. for me, I mean, outside of Rosebud, I'm, look, I, I think the movie's good. I think it's good. I don't think it's the goat. Some people hold it as the goat, <laughs> greatest of all time. Right. And I'm, and I would take, you know what I mean? Like for me, I would say, well, you can take Citizen Kane and I'll raise you a Maltese Falcon, a Casablanca, or even, a, I mean, to, I don't know, maybe Notorious from Hitchcock. I mean, my goodness gracious, Cary yeah, Grant, yeah. Ingrid Bergman, and uh, what was the other one? Claude Rains. My goodness gracious, mm -hmm. that is, those are powerhouses, if you know Absolutely. what I'm saying. I mean, those are just films that just come off the top of my head. And yes, I have them on Blu ray and that I do collect. I did. Oh, I, I'm a big, I like Notorious, uh, though. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Listen, notorious, listen, I. I <laughs> When I, when I went into, you know, Barnes and Noble, they hold the Criterion 50% off sales during the course Absolutely. of the calendar year, right? <laughs> yes, so I'm going do. in there and I look at these different films and, I'm, and, I, and I look through and I'm thinking, Notorious, what is this? Mm -hmm. And then it says, Cary Grant, Ingrid Bergman, Claude Ray, I'm like, sold, doesn't Bye. matter. Don't care what the movie's about. I'm buying this because Ingrid Bergman, when I saw Casablanca for mm -hmm. the first, now granted, I saw Casablanca for the first time on PBS. Okay, yeah. They, they were doing a movie night one night, right? So I caught it on there. I taped it on my DVR respectively, and I watched it, and I thought, oh, my dear Lord, this film is incredible. <laughs> and then they re and then they re released it for, I believe it was the 75th anniversary uh, okay. for, from TCM or whatever it was, and they presented it on theater, on theater screens. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I took a friend of mine, and we went, in, we went into the theater, and I watched it on a big screen, and I'm thinking, this is amazing. This, this is incredible. Like, this is a film that was made so long ago, but it holds up beautifully and you are just captivated from minute one when the music is chiming in there mm. the announcer saying well everyone is fleeing and they in a french morocco and it's just yep. and then people are pickpocketing people people are getting shot in the street and then you see the sign it says cafe american it's ricks you're in ricks man just and claude rains claude rains. yeah he can such do whatever a, he would you say one. one word and claude rains just held your attention for whatever he's doing you know what i mean mm-hmm yeah, it's definitely an iconic film, and that Casablanca rendition by Julie Wilson, like it's like haunting, like it's just cinema history in the making. It really, really is. Play it, Sam. Sorry, I can't help it. I, just, <laughs> I love, but Casablanca is one of my all-time greats. It's one of my all-time favorites. There's no That's question about it. Anytime it, when Ingrid Bergman shows up, you are just captivated. I mean, listen, she looks beautiful, but she's got great acting chops. Oh Incredible. yeah, incredible. She walks into the room. I'm thinking, who is this? No, can we hear? Can we learn more about you, please? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, it is, since you're a Casablanca fan, um, it, it's worth for you to know if you don't know already that uh, the the trench coats that uh, Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman wear, they are in the uh, the Warner Brothers archive. They're out on display. The last time I was there, if you take the Warner Brothers classic tour, um, mm -hmm. you should be able to see them. And you'll also wander past some Maltese falcons as well. And uh, they have this big globe that uh, Ingrid uh, wound up posing with for some publicity stills for Casablanca that is just still there. Among other things, um, yeah, that I wandered past a lot of movie history on that tour. Um, and you mentioned Notorious too, and I just wanted to say, uh, and mm -hmm. if anyone can can top this, uh, I think Notorious has the best on-screen chemistry I've ever seen in a film. Just Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman, I'm like, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is it, man. <laughs> So uh, if anyone else uh, has has a recommendation for something that can top that for on-screen chemistry, I'm here for it. But I think Notorious might be the winner there. 
<laughs> That's a good point. It's a good point. Man, if anyone else has thoughts on this, please, please, I echo what Annette just presented us with, with here. Please let us know, because goodness gracious, there's so many to go through. And these filmographies, mm -hmm. oh, man, I mean, look, Notorious is one of my favorite Hitchcock films. I think my favorite Hitchcock film in general, though, may be Rear Window, because James Stewart and I, and Grace Grace Kelly. Grace Kelly. Gorgeous, yeah. One of the most beautiful, <laughs> captivating women of her time, of just of all time, really, because her mm -hmm. acting show, when she digs into a role, like she owns it. She mm -hmm. owns that character. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's, that's a phenomenal film. I'd say for Hitchcock's, yeah, Rear Window is up there for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually, yeah, gosh, I think it was um, two summers ago, I had my first drive-in movie experience and they did a double Hitchcock night. Uh, they did a Rear Window and then Vertigo after that. And just both of those were cool to see on the screen, but especially in that uh, drive-in setting. But yeah, Rear Window is a great one for me. And uh, my entry into Hitchcock was The Birds too. So I think that's also pretty high up there for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. That was a creepy crawly movie for mm -hmm. sure. Birds yeah. just out of nowhere, and all of a sudden they start attacking people. What the heck for? I don't know. They're just crazy. Maybe. I mean, that was that was Hitchcock's stamp on it. I'm not really sure, but mm -hmm. hey, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, my first Hitchcock film that I ever watched was To Catch a Thief, and they were playing that in theaters. Yeah, yeah. And I caught that because of, what was it, Cary Grant once again, Grace Kelly, and we yeah. saw that clip earlier in this in this show where I haven't got a decent watch. Steal yeah. one. My yeah. gosh, just uh -huh. she owns it, man. Yeah. She just owns it. Like whatever she asks you to do, you just you you say to yourself, "I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it." But then you take another look. You're like, mm, "I may have to obey her." <laughs> She's too pretty. She's such a, not that that's a bad thing. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that that's no. There's no shame in that. But still, I digress. Yeah, oh. it's great seeing these movies the way they were meant to be seen. I think, like in oh, that theater with that communal it. experience, hearing mm -hmm. people react, it just makes that experience I think that much more enjoyable and engaging. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, I've seen a number of classic films uh, on the big screen for the first time, whether it was TCM Presents or you know, was it TCM Big Screen Classics? I believe is the name of the series. Yeah, Big Screen Classics and yeah. Film Events, which yeah, it's it's. It's back, but it's it's, mm -hmm. a, it's been a little while because of the pandemic. <laughs> right, right. There's also Fathom events and so on and so forth. I'm trying to, gosh almighty, I'm trying to think. Oh well, here's here's a, here's a funny here. Well, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's funny, but it's a bit of a more uh, interesting story. I went to a convention, and I encourage you to check this out when you have an opportunity, and for you as well, who may be watching or listening to this. It's called the Mid Atlantic Nostalgia Convention. Okay. And it's held in September every year, normally in Hunt Valley, Maryland, because I'm in the state of Maryland. So for me. It's okay. only a 20, 30 mile drive. It's only a 20 minute drive for me. Yay, locals. Nice. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> so what they do at this convention, Annette, is that they, they have actors and actresses who have played different roles in different series or different movies that, you know, take place within that either the golden age or a little bit past it, like in the 70s, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe a bit of the 80s. And they've had such wonderful actors and actresses from some of the James Bond films, you know, wow. the early Bond films. They had Miriam Dabo, Olivia Dabo. They've had some of the other Bond girls. They've had... Uh, members of the cast of Leave It to Beaver and Fun. things of that nature. And they have vendors that sell, you know, old school theater posters, old school, you know, theater cards and some of the press kits that were released mm -hmm. during certain parts of cinematic history, which I'm sure you are more than familiar with. So, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would encourage you to to look this up. Check it out. I will. You and I will talk backstage and I'll send you some links there where you can uh, have more information uh, to look at at your leisure. But yes. Because of that convention, they had the actor who played the role of the Gill Man and Creature from the Black Lagoon. He, oh, he was in wow. the suit during the underwater sequences, Rico yeah. Browning. Yeah, okay, yeah. To be more specific. So mm -hmm. he was there, and he did a Q&A that night during the convention weekend. And after his Q&A, they played the movie Creature from the Black Lagoon oh, from Universal. Um, and mm -hmm. I had never seen any of the classic Universal Monsters films up to this point. So I was <laughs> oh, exposed no. to the greatness yeah. That is Creature from the Black Lagoon. Because after the movie was over that night, I, like that night, the next morning, I went to a vendor's booth and I bought the Blu-ray. I thought, nice. this is freaking yeah. incredible. I was creeped out. It was a bit scary. I mean, yes, you know, it may not be as scary as some of the other stuff. But at the same time, you got to appreciate that someone was willing to wear that suit and make it believable. Yeah. Because when I watch that movie, I'm thinking, this Gil man is legit. This is not, you know, <laughs> some computer generated. This is real. Right. Yeah, yeah. This, the effects and, alone. Yeah, and then they filmed, you know, in, in a, what was it? They filmed in like a back lot where there was a river or, a, you know, whatever it was at Universal. Mm -hmm. And what was it? Julia Adams, I believe, was, the, Adams, yeah. was the creature's, you know, I wouldn't say femme fatale, but love interest. Yeah. Uh-huh. And she's in there. And I'm thinking, my 
goodness gracious, for a universal horror film, this is great. I was thrilled when I watched this film. So there you go. There's one of my journeys into cinematic history. You know what I mean? Such a good one. And yeah, and that one even, I think, inspired more films. There there are sequels to it. And even fairly recently, so I think 2017 is when The Shape of Water was released. So that was mm -hmm. sort of an homage too, to a uh, creature from the Black Lagoon as well. And it's a little happier, I think, than it does for <laughs> the, the creature yeah. himself and, and the other renditions. But yeah, such a good one. Those universal horrors are, are fantastic. Yeah, and, uh, and maybe someone out there may not know this, but before the more the Marvel Cinematic Universe was interconnected, the Universal Monster movies mm -hmm. were connected. Yeah, because all the characters would appear in different films of each character, and then you would have what was it? Uh, was Abin Costello? You know, meet the Wolfman, meet this, <laughs> right. meet that, and those films were kind of connected from the other films. So, mm -hmm. hey, I'm just saying, folks, Universal did it first. They did, yeah. There are all these fun collaborations with, I think, is it Dracula and Frankenstein, too? And then the Abbott and Costellos, there's like multiple monsters chasing them, too. So The Wolfman. Uh, definitely, yeah, the Wolfman. Speaking of Claude Rains, uh, I mean. The Invisible you, Man, yeah. The Invisible, the Invis which, by the way, that's another one of my favorite uh, uh -huh. Universal Monster films, is The Invisible Man, Phantom of the Opera with Claude Rains in the title role. Because I know there was a different version of that, but I'm talking about the 43, I think it was. 1943 was Fam of the Opera. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Claude Rains. Sorry, with the, the older one, there's uh, Lon Chaney did it. Too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was the okay. different one. But yeah, yeah, The Wolfman with Lon Chaney Jr. My Such goodness. Such a good one. Yeah, that's a that's great That's a fan flippantastic fantastic movie, if I do say mm -hmm. so myself. I'm just saying. But yeah, my goodness gracious. Uh, wonderful stories, wonderful films. What Do you have any tips or little bit of pieces of advice for aspiring mm -hmm. bloggers? Oh, um, well, I think uh, as, as long as you've like identified whatever your, your interest is, like if it's classic Hollywood or, or something entirely different, I think that's that's the, the hardest step really is figuring out what it is you want to write about. Uh, and then uh, thinking about where where it is that you fit in, like what could you contribute to the conversation that is maybe unique or different from what you see other bloggers doing. Uh, so uh, that I think uh, can, can lead you down a road of creating a blog that is unique and that regard and uh, gives you, um, I think, uh, audiences uh, and, and followers that are very curious in your output because no one else is doing something that's quite like it or, or exactly the same. Uh, so I think that that's the, the biggest thing. And then I think uh, the next step is just start writing. <laughs> I think uh, for me, I, I think uh, it's just the, the having the, the discipline to just sit down and write <laughs> and uh, make sure that you are uh, contributing uh, regularly to uh, the greater discussion about what, whatever your subject matter matter is. And uh, definitely to have a way for people to get in touch with you. So if you're creating a Twitter or a Facebook page or um, something else, like maybe a blog specific email. Um, for me, I love hearing back from other people who have read my work or maybe attended a presentation I've done, something like that. Um, whether it's them commenting on our website or emailing me or getting in touch with me on some sort of social media platform that I'm present on. But for me, um, I find that really validating and it, it really just makes me happy to see that someone out there is enjoying what my output is. I'm not just creating articles and just throwing them against the wall, really, uh, for no one to read. So it's, it's great to always get that engagement. And uh, with that being said, too, uh, maybe look for opportunities to collaborate as well. So if you see someone out there who's like specializing in what uh, what it is that you are interested in, reach out to them. See if uh, maybe there's a way that you can work together or if there's a way that they can showcase some of your work and figure out if there's a, a way to work together in some way. Did you hear that, friends? Wonderful pieces <laughs> of advice from the incredible Annette Bohannock. Make sure you're sharing this video with all 800 of your closest friends. They're going to like the way they look after watching this video, I guarantee. If you got any questions for her, let us know. A few people have chimed in here, Annette, so I would like to bring these to your sure, attention yeah. if, if I could. Philip chimes in, wow, what a great museum with cookies. With cookies There's yeah. an old show called California's Gold with Huel Hauser, and he did an amazing show about Vincent Price's art museum. Most oh, people wow. don't know that Vincent Price was a huge art collector back in the day. Very cool. Yeah. So I'm learning so much about Vince. Um, and yeah, Philip, you, you might already be aware then there's a new uh, Vincent Price cookbook that just came out with, uh, I think that Peter Fuller was the um, the editor on that one. So you, you might want to check out that one too and see Vince's recipes and some of the, the different star recipes in there, uh, the individuals he worked with who also like to cook and bake. So also a little bit of Vince, <laughs> Vince uh, fun to add to the con conversation.
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And he uh, continues to chime in with uh, Philip Miller says, Hollywood Kitchen, that's awesome. Did not yeah. know about that show particularly. And then he says, Vincent Price's daughter, Victoria Price, has several books about her dad and does fan events for him as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thankfully, she's also very involved in the legacy and she gave her stamp of approval on that cookbook as well. And she's regularly doing appearances and uh, helping pay tribute to her father, especially uh, during different film screenings. Hmm. Let's see here. Uh, Terry MacGyver, our good friend from overseas, he's all the way in Ireland. He chimes in here. He says, which movie, when it comes on television, do you absolutely mm. have to tune into? We all have at least one movie that we have seen 1,000 times over. So which one would it be for you, Annette? Oh, man. <laughs> um, I'd say I think for me, <laughs> and uh, it's probably uh, unfortunate due to the length of the film, but uh, when I'm Gone with the Wind comes on, I'm like, uh, like no, no matter where I am in this story, I feel like mm, I know I'm going to get immersed in this. I know how it's going to end. I know it's going to happen. But you know what? I'm here. <laughs> I'm here for it. <laughs> You're just great. You know, you don't hear that often because I actually saw Gone with the Wind during a, uh, a theater in, in a theater. They were playing it. They played the intro and they played what was it? The um, the intermission, I believe, yeah, that there is in yeah. the middle of the film. Because what is it? A four hour movie? Gee whiz. Yeah, uh, I've, I've only seen it on the big screen once before. Um, at, so back in the Chicago area, we have this like mm -hmm. beautiful Art Deco movie palace called the Pickwick Theater, and mm -hmm. they occasionally like run classic films. And one of their big screenings was Gone with the Wind. And yeah, that was the first time that I had like really the full movie experience for Gone with the Wind, like with um, the, the beginning sequence, sitting through the whole like first act of it, and then that intermission uh, sequence as well, and then the, the rest of the film. But yeah, you really learn the value of that intermission because <laughs> it's a long time to be sitting in those theater seats there you go but i will be honest with you annette and i may lose some points here maybe i may lose points with you who are watching or listening to this i watched gone with the wind all the way through i did i sat through the whole thing mm. i didn't i don't really like it all that much it just doesn't ring ring a ring true for me you know what i mean it's just just didn't work for me plus it's a bummer depressing film i mean i knew it was going to be it had elements of you know it was set during a dark time don't get me wrong mm -hmm. but it's a bummer film yeah like it's yeah. a really dog like the i'm sorry to say this and i'm really sorry to say this but don't you feel it's a bit of a depressing film that you may not want to watch i mean listen you love it too. you can watch it a thousand times over but for me i'm not going to rush back and watch that film you know what i mean well, no, wait, there's not enough time in the day, but <laughs> I think uh, Gone with the Wind is a, a film, I think, like, it, it is complicated in its own right, especially, like, granted, it's a legacy and, and how it presents itself in 2022, but I think, um, for me, something about, I think, the the undertaking that this film was, just knowing how many people were involved with this project, how much of a challenge it was to bring that book to the screen, and how uh, just legendary the whole casting part of that was, just the search for Scar Scarlett O'Hara was insane. Like every actress wanted to be Scarlett, wanted to be in Vivian Lee's shoes for this role. And so um, I think just uh, kind of doing those backstories make me value the film more. Yeah, granted, the, the ending is a bummer. And <laughs> there are many, many moments in the story that are definitely not happy. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I do always say that my favorite part of the film is like really like the, the beginning sequences when the story is that it's like most colorful. We see Vivian oh. Lee in her most like but, elaborate costumes too. The, the I love, yeah, the Walter Plunkett costumes are yeah. just gorgeous. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I particularly enjoy like those sequences too, uh, as well, just seeing that the costume designs that came into play. So I think mm -hmm. it's yeah, the artistry behind it kind of keeps me wanting to watch it and wanting to watch it more. Um, you know, the, the more I see it, the more frustrated I get with like Scarlett O'Hara. <laughs> and uh, uh, the more interested I become in like the Melanie character uh, as the years have gone on. But it's one of those <laughs> films where it's long enough too, where every time I revisit it, um, I notice something different or, um, I, I look at a certain character in another way. So it's just that's, uh, yeah, how it is. No, that's fair. It's fair. You know, tomorrow is another day. True. You know, <laughs> as she tries to tell us. And by the way, going back to Hitchcock here, Fez chimes in. Fez, what's up, buddy? Good to see you. He says Psycho was the first yeah. Hitchcock film he saw. And let me tell you something. Great one. S Psycho, that is one heck <laughs> of a thriller. 
Yep. Goodness gracious, the moment it starts to the very end when you find out what the reveal is of who the actual killer is. Like I said, I went into this pretty cold. I didn't know who the who the killer was. But when you find out who it is, it's like, oh, that is messed yeah. up. Oh, it's messed up. Yep. <laughs> it's messed yeah. up, but it's so good. It's messed up. I'm just saying. Anthony Perkins yeah. is phenomenal in that role. Like I still think of his like whole ending sequence, and it's just <laughs> so, yeah. so certain, magic. Char certain character maybe in the interrogation room looks dead in the mirror and just gives that evil grin, evil yep. smile. Like something's <laughs> about to it. happen here, folks, and it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> nope. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, Sonia chimes in. She says, "Hello, everyone. Hello to you, Sonia. Thanks for being with us. We do appreciate it." Let's see. Uh, Fez says that Universal Pictures, I believe, has tried to do the Monster Universe again. Well, they tried with yeah. 27, I believe it was 2017's or 2018's The Mummy with <laughs> Tom Cruise. Ugh. That didn't yeah. that didn't go over well now, did it? No, I think that's the one. Or, yeah, they were, like, in this process of doing a whole bunch of these, like, remakes, revisitations of these classic movie monsters. What did they, they did, like, a Wolfman. I think that they did, um, gosh. Well, I'm more kidding. recently, they did The Invisible Man, but Invisible that came out from, that came out from Blumhouse. Oh, okay. Um, and then, yeah, it was like the terrible, like Tom Cruise mummy. I think at one point they have like in a jar, like the gill man's like hand or something. So that was like an allusion to the creature. And I think they wanted to just bring that whole universe back together. But yeah, yeah, it didn't work out. And I do love the mummy for the record. Like that is my favorite universal classic. I even really enjoyed like the nineties Brendan Fraser ones like that. I have on my DVD shelf. No problem. But yeah, Tom Cruise, I wanted to like it. I wanted to give it a chance, but mm -mm. <laughs> Past. And, and you're right, Fez. Originally, it was going to be called the Dark Universe that Universal right. was trying to put together, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, it fell through. And they had like six big name actors already cast to like lead films yeah. or appear in other films. Did you see the cast photo that had Tom Cruise, Javier Bardem, Sofia Batella, Russell Crowe, oh, wow. uh, Johnny Depp was going to be in it? Um, and my goodness, <laughs> they, they had like six of the biggest names in the industry at that point, at least at that point, to star in these movies. And unfortunately, it just fell through. Yeah. Yeah, we'll never know. Maybe it was for the best, but it probably was. I mean, one. the mummy didn't do it any favors. But then again, I would have been okay if they had continued it because there's always potential to you know to clean up the mess and like do a soft reboot. Mm, you know, mm -hmm. as as they call it in Hollywood Maybe. terms. Maybe uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they do. Well, the Invisible Man came out a few years ago from Blumhouse, and that starred, I believe, it was Elizabeth Moss from Mad Men. Oh, okay. As the uh, the 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 victim, because the, in this iteration of the care of the Invisible Man, to be more specific, to be more specific, sorry, mm -hmm. he creates a suit that allows him to be invisible, mm. but he terrorizes his girlfriend, and Elizabeth Moss is trying to get away from him and file a restraining oh, order, oh, and yes. all this, yes, all this other remember. dark stuff comes up during the course of the film. I gotta say, it's pretty good. Like for a remake, I mean, granted, I still think my boy, what's up, Claude Rains? I still think that one is probably the cream of the crop. Yeah. But the re but the remake slash reboot it's not bad for like a modern day interpretation of that story hmm. it works because technology has come so far oh yeah in the last sure. like 70 70 80 years I guess yeah I'm not 100 percent yeah, sure yeah that... absolutely it'll keep going <laughs> and they're gonna keep that train rolling on that and then Terry says uh Scarlet was a very good follow-up to uh gone with the wind it's well worth checking out yeah I mean look if you're a gone with the wind fan Terry listen you can have it yeah, I'll, just be over, I was, <laughs> I'll be over was, here with some of the other films and have a bit of, of a happier yeah. ending. Yeah, it's uh, it, yeah. If you want the, the happier ending, watch Scarlet. But mm, for me, it, it didn't have the same weight that the original God with the Wind did. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought he was referring to something else. Never mind. Yeah, I got well, it mixed there was up. A, a Scarlet like um made for TV, I think series. I forget who stars in that one, but um yeah, that hmm. wound up continuing the story basically. Oh, I'm sorry, Annette. I mm -hmm. misunderstood what he was saying, but yeah. Hmm. Was the follow-up series any good, though, or am I missing something? Um, I didn't enjoy it, but other people might have. It's more like romantic novel-esque, <laughs> like romantic novel to screen uh, is kind of the, the impression that I got. But, um, um, oh my goodness, um, who plays a, oh my goodness, I think is it, is it Boromir in Lord of the Rings? He's in it. <laughs> as well so oh, Bor like some... oh boromir yeah yeah yeah, yeah um oh, gosh Dean? who's Bor who's Dean? boromir yeah. is it john reese davies or is it i'm gonna google this <laughs> no Bor no boromir or sean bean yeah it is sean bean sean bean is in scarlet uh, as well so they like randomly have like some bigger name stars in this one Ooh. which might be worth seeing if you are interested in that but i do like yeah. sean bean i think he's a very yeah. great accomplished actor it just seems that in every movie he's in he always dies i won't say anything <laughs> <laughs> 
You ever notice that about him? Every movie that Sean's been in, he always dies at the end, except for National Treasure with Nick Cage. He just gets arrested. Oh, uh, got out of that, that one alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they actually started a campaign online that says hashtag don't kill Sean. Don't kill him. Yeah, I remember that. You remember that? Mm hmm. I wonder if he's. St I think his character is still alive and and kicking in the series uh, Snowpiercer. That's an adaptation of the movie on TNT. Oh, I, I I'm not familiar. Yeah, yeah. Sean Bean plays one of the uh, corporate overlords, like ruler of the train. Gotcha. You know, kind of kind of thing. If anyone else knows what I'm talking about when it comes to Snowpiercer, what exactly is Sean Bean's character, and what's his like? What's his end game? You know what I mean? Like, what's his goal? I'm not really sure. If anyone else knows about that, let me know. Because by the way, Snowpiercer is a dystopian future type film mm. and that it's actually good it's really good it's, it's good. got uh, in the movie not because i can't comment on the tv series i haven't seen it but in the movie it stars chris evans i believe tilda swinton mm -hmm. is in it as well am i thinking of that right yeah there's a, oh ed harris oh wow okay yeah. ed harris is in that movie it's true yeah. So if you ever get a chance to watch some of the stuff that doesn't take place between 1910s and 1960s, <laughs> feel free to check out the modern day Snowpiercer. So give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> you may, yeah. You might want to. She Willikers. You might want to think about that. So, with that being said, uh, once again, uh, you are here. You are listening or watching. And I quote, and I'm your host, Ryan of Neuroculture. We are joined by the incredible film historian, archivist, and, and just overall wonderful person to learn from. <laughs> Annette Bohannik here on the show. If you have any con or excuse me, have any questions for her, let us know in the chat. Let us know in the lot. Let us know in the comments. We monitor as we go throughout the course of the show. But as we await some wonderful questions, wonderful comments from our viewers or you know, listener, who if you may be listening to this, that's great. Make sure you're sharing it with all your closest friends. They're going to like the way they look, and they may learn a thing or two from Annette Bohannik. Let me tell you something. <laughs> she's got a lot of knowledge that she's dropping on you. I'm just saying. But this episode of And I Quote, and every episode of And I Quote, should I say, Annette, is powered mm -hmm. by Poddex. Now, Poddex. Or the hottest new tool for podcasters looking to have more meaningful conversations or simply gamify their podcast. What you do here is that you shuffle up the cards, you ask a question, you let the content roll. It's that simple. Make sure you go to poddex.com and use the promo code NerdCulture, all one word, to get 10% off your first order. You're not going to miss out. You're not going to want to miss out, excuse me, on that incredible opportunity. So with that being said, Annette, if you can instantly, outside of the stuff you are, you've already learned, <laughs> If you can instantly become one, what would you want to be an expert in? Hmm. Wow. Um, <laughs> gosh, uh, I think hmm, that's that's a tough one. There's there's a lot of different facets for like classic Hollywood that I'd love to be uh, a pro in. Hmm. I think. Um, well, one one thing that I, I really admire sometimes about like uh, scholars of like classic film is their availability to like just look at something like some sort of like a set piece or even just a costume and like immediately like know like when else that piece was used like in different films. So I think that's a skill that um, I'm really intrigued by since um, I, I love to collect like different pieces from the era. So things like props, um, costumes uh, and uh, just like photos, etc., movie posters even. And uh, in particular, the story behind costumes, I think, is really, really interesting since Hollywood uh, notoriously, especially like during the classic era, they really had no intention of preserving their own heritage. Uh, so a film was seen as just like product. So once it was like cranked out, it was usually just like discarded or destroyed. And um, all of the, the pieces that went into its creation, whether it was a costume prop, et cetera, um, were also discarded. Or in some cases, they were just put back in the studio warehouse. And cataloging for that was kind of a mess. Studios would loan costumes to one another, and things would often get lost in the shuffle. And uh, it got to this point where just decades later, there was just almost no good tracking of who had what, who originally owned what. And so uh, like these these pieces were, were turning up in like different studio wardrobes and being used in films uh, and being used outside of the studio as well uh, with the different people who were working uh, in wardrobe and with the studios to uh, not not even having any idea of the history of a piece. So there was like a photo I just saw the other day of uh, just some random like uh, actress wearing one of Marilyn Monroe's outfits from Bus Stop. And uh, mm. like that was just like seeing the light of day and not being treated as a, a historical piece. So I think there was this element of continuing to like put these 
props and costumes to work. So it, it wouldn't be uh, unusual to see an actress wear something that was worn previously by another actress in a really big name film, just since studios wanted to get a lot of use out of it. But um, by the 1970s, when sort of that, that classic Hollywood era was, was ending, uh, big studios like MGM had amassed just huge collections of costumes and pieces, and uh, they were going through changes in ownership, and uh, those new owners were not seeing value in those pieces and uh, wanted to get rid of all that as much as possible. So there were notoriously like the great MGM auctions in the 1970s, um, where these major pieces like you know Dorothy's ruby slippers, um, various costumes from different films, uh, Marilyn's like white dress from the Seven Year Itch, uh, and, and many, many other pieces were auctioned off and just that those collections were scattered all over the world everything else that didn't sell chucked into a landfill buried <laughs> that's it uh, so that was um hollywood history and a lot of our cultural heritage just gone but uh interestingly so there uh were different individuals who were interested in collecting um some of them big names like debbie reynolds uh the the actress she had an eye for preservation and wanted to start buying up these pieces from auction and did so uh and had her goal of creating a museum there was also i think it was ken warner um, who was working for studios and took it upon himself to liberate pieces that um, that he knew were going to be discarded otherwise. So I think it's, it's him we have to thank for just exploring the uh, MGM wardrobe department one day and just finding on one of the the top floors and just dusty boxes, um, just boxes of several pairs of the original like ruby slippers and like just critical like early uh, cinema costumes and pieces. Um, mm. But uh, to to go on with um, with your your original question here, uh, some of those uh, costumes though, uh, because of the mismanagement and labels and cataloging, we have pieces that exist, but we don't know who wore them in what film. Or sometimes there's like codes written on the tags that meant something for a wardrobe department in terms of like which costumes to pull out for a given film but to us in like 2022 we have to do a lot of like backtracking and figuring out like what the heck does this code mean what does this digit signify in terms of which film they were working on or which scene that was in and there is a, a very like hardcore niche group of costume collectors that I'm part of on Facebook that's so good at this <laughs> and uh, uh, with one of the costumes that I had um, I, I just had this like little like cigarette girl costume that I bought off eBay one day and it was listed as just like 1960s cigarette girl costume whatever and I was like yeah it's cool it's it's fairly low in cost. I just bought it. And um, it had the original Warner Brothers tagging on it, as well as this code. So just, I, I sat on it for a while. And then eventually, it, it, I, I was cleaning and it resurfaced for me. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to just throw it out to the group. I'm going to like expect nothing to come of this. But within like five minutes of posting my question with the tag, I got the name of the film, I got photos of the actress wearing it uh, in the film. And then uh, soon I got yet another person uh, talking about where else this dress was used on uh, what other films. So I really, really value like the community of collectors out there that there are people who are interested in this area. And again, in other like niches within this area. And so um, that that decoding skill and that that ability to identify pieces is something that, that I highly admire and wish I could do. My goodness gracious. And I thought my collection of reprints of classic movie posters and a prop replica of the Maltese Falcon statue that I got from someone, yeah. Arsenal Models, who makes <laughs> nice. some of this stuff. I got a replica of the Maltese Falcon, so I have it sitting here on one of my dressers. And sometimes when I look at it, I think of that line that we saw in that video. What is it? The uh, stuff that dreams stuff are made. The dreams are made of, yeah. Gosh, it's such a <laughs> man. Bogey, man, you just knock it out of the park every time I see him on screen, man. I gotta, I gotta check out more Bogey's filmography because I've only seen a couple of his uh, films. Don't get me wrong, but I need to delve deeper into that filmography because that man is a boss. Oh man, Very yeah, cool. such a good one. I love his um, Sabrina. If you haven't seen The Petrified Forest, some early Bogey, watch that movie. I haven't seen that. I might have to add that to my list. Thank you for bringing that up, Annette uh -huh. Bohannock, the incredible uh, film historian uh, extraordinaire. So if you were to pass on tomorrow, what little thing would you regret not doing? Hmm. Well, I think uh, I have a long list of different film uh, related sites that I still want to visit. Um, so there's like Lucille Ball's hometown, certainly Judy Garland's hometown, and there's still so much more that I need to see in like the Los Angeles area. Uh, so I think it would be uh, just a regret for not 
traveling <laughs> and uh, kind of continuing all of those um, those additional sites that I've wanted to see. Uh, but really, I think uh, one thing that um, I'm, I'm really proud of is, is the writing that I've been able to do to disperse um, and certainly uh, to share through um, the Hometowns to Hollywood book. Um, in, in running and being part of this um, Classic Movie Bloggers Association community, I'm so lucky to connect with other uh, bloggers as well. And uh, really in reading their work, it makes me think about like, um, how cool it is that we're, we're still discussing this legacy, we're producing output, and I want to preserve as much as my of my written content as possible for, for people to enjoy and be able to access if they, they aren't familiar with like blogging and if they, they don't uh, read articles regularly on the internet or just have them uh, be able to be disseminated through um, through my book, uh, for example. So I think uh, as long as the, the words live on, I think I'll, I'll be happy. And um, as long as those stories are still out there and being celebrated, um, I think um, that that's very gratifying for me. And um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, in, in the end, we're, we're all stories. I think Margaret Atwood uh, came up with that quote that in the end, we are all stories. So I think it's an honor for me to delve back into the lives of some of these different individuals and to honor them through, um, through writing and to continue to keep their stories out there. Mm, my goodness gracious, absolutely couldn't agree more. Now, if you could be guaranteed just one thing in life besides money, what would it be? Hmm. Um, I think uh, the, gosh, I think it, it, in a sense, I think a curiosity uh, for, for one thing is something that, that I would love to continue to be, um, uh, be granted and guaranteed. Um, I think a, a strong part of me pursuing these different creative endeavors, um, whether it's the writing, the presentations, or um, creating a book, um, that uh, that none of that would be if I didn't have any drive or any constant curiosity. Uh, if there was nothing left for me to um, really explore further, I don't think there would be much output <laughs> really for me uh, either. So I think as long as I have that passion, that drive, that curiosity, that, that spark to continue producing output, um, that would be a wonderful thing to have guaranteed. Mm, good stuff. Good stuff. Now, which words or maybe phrases do you most overuse? Hmm. I don't know. I think someone in the comments will probably be like, you said, um, a bunch of times for sure. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, hmm. I don't know offhand what would I overuse, uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm not sure on that front, <laughs> but I, I do wind up being guilty of, of dropping several movie quotes. So maybe I'm just not aware of, <laughs> of that at least, but mm. nobody's perfect. I, I love some like it hot. I'll, I'll drop that quote quite a bit. And among others, yeah, there's a, there's a few that I think uh, true, true classic film fans will, will recognize from like Laurel and Hardy shorts. Um, I'll say like another fine mess or, uh, whenever I travel to Los Angeles, there's the film Sons of the Desert, um, where Stan and Ollie are kind of hiding from their wives that they have gone to a convention in Chicago and they tell, yeah, they're, they're on the phone um, with, with a friend they meet at the convention and say that they're from Los Angeles. <laughs> and um, the, the guy who responds to them is Charlie Chase. He's like, oh, you mean Los Angeles? So from that point on, I say, I'm going to Los Angeles <laughs> and, see, um, <laughs> and see who gets it. And then surprisingly, some people do. <laughs> Goodness gracious. That's one way to pronounce certain words and terminologies. I'm just saying, but still, I digress. What do you consider to be the most overrated virtue? Hmm. Maybe patience. <laughs> uh i think yeah patience waiting for something i say just just do it yourself <laughs> okay straight into the point i see <laughs> yeah i think uh, as is the case with like some of these articles um and some of these stars uh there, there are moments where some of these individuals are going to be paid tribute to, but then like some events don't pan out or just don't happen. So and if I if I hear that something has like fallen through or just like isn't going to happen due to the pandemic, I'm just going to go ahead and like write the article about their story anyway, and then revisit it later once something does happen uh, in relation to them or their legacy. So that's just like one of the things that's kind of thrown a wrench in the writing is like uh, for a little while I wasn't able to travel, obviously, since no one was able <laughs> to really travel. Everyone was stuck at home for a little while there. Um, 
And so um, I had to be reliant upon uh, my backlog of different articles and produce content that way and do my best and, and communicate from afar what was happening uh, in these different stars hometowns and to uh, create that on the blog. Hmm. Okay. All right. Patience. They always say that patience is a virtue, but maybe it's overrated. Maybe I'm overreaching. I don't know. <laughs> you know, they say patience when you wait for stuff. Good things come to those who wait. Good things come to those who write too. <laughs> Yes. That's true too. However you want to, you know, interpret that or slice it or dice it, that's, you know, up to you and it's up to you in that I'll, you know, however you want to go about it. So the, now that we've talked about a lot of some of the things that have taken place within the golden age of Hollywood, let's fast forward to today. We're mm -hmm. here. We're, it's now it's 2022. Something I believe is known as the Oscars yeah. are coming up very, very soon. If, if not this weekend or next week, whichever one it is, but Early, what are your, what are some of your predictions? What is going to go down at the Oscars this year? Who do you think is going to take home that legendary trophy? Oh man! Well, the Oscars are this Sunday night, so um, this Sunday, eight p.m. Eastern, and I think there's pre carpet or pre show coverage rather, live from the red carpet, an hour or so before if you're into that. Uh, as far as my predictions go, well. I think I'm, I'm hoping this ceremony will top last year's. Last year's was probably the most bizarre with uh, everything being distanced and held across different venues. It was sort of just an, an odd setup, but kind of had to be because of uh, the, the constraints placed on the Academy and uh, in accordance with the safety re regulations for the pandemic. Uh, but I think uh, as far as this year's nominees go, there's a lot uh, that, that are, I think, uh, worthy films to be seen uh, for, for me. And I think probably for many others, um, just like really the tail end of last year was my first kind of foray back into the movie theaters and seeing new releases. I think it was West Side Story that finally got my, my foot in the door for uh, for newer films. I saw West Side Story, Nightmare Alley, the new Spider-Man, of course, and, uh, and several others along the way. So I think uh, that tail end of that year was um, was my uh, my return to the movies. But since then, how people consume movies has also changed. So we see a lot of these like streaming studios that are now like key players in terms of the Oscars and Oscar nominees. We have Best Picture nominees from Netflix, from Apple, uh, from Amazon uh, as well uh, historically in the Oscars. So uh, a lot has changed in terms of how we're accessing and consuming movies. As far as my predictions go though, um, I think Belfast um, is probably going to get Best Picture Sure. I'm partial to musicals, so um, in my own very non-objective way of thinking, I would have just given it to West Side Story just because I love to uh, to see musicals on screen again and to still hear people discuss them and hopefully um, get encouraged to watch the, the earlier version of West Side Story or earlier version of other musicals that have made the transition to screen. Uh, best actor, I think, is going to be Will Smith for his uh, work in King Richard. Uh, best actress, I'm thinking Jessica Chastain for uh, The Eyes of Tammy Faye. I think she did a really good performance there as well. Um, so those are my thoughts uh, as far as some of the like the, the most coveted awards of the evening. Um, I did want to uh, give an honorable mention to Nightmare Alley since I love like the 1947 film with John Power. I think it's Colleen Gray and uh, Joan Blondell. And I thought that this rendition of the film got away with a lot of what the, the 1947 one couldn't. Like obviously with it being the 40s, censorship was still very much, much an issue. Uh, so this film was darker, truer to the original novel. And I think more haunting as a result, certainly has a different ending as well, thanks to the, the production code. Um, but uh, I think the the sets in Nightmare Alley were really just gorgeous. I love Art Deco, so just seeing their, their production design was just stunning to me. I hope that gets an award for production design. Um, yeah, and the Best Supporting Actress, I think, is going to go to Ariana DeBose for uh, West Side Story. So those are some of my my predictions for the evening. Um, and I think uh, one that is really interesting right now, too, is cinematography. There are a lot of films that are um, up for awards this year that have just been so beautifully shot that I think there's, there's a lot of really strong contenders. Um, we have Dune, which has just stunning cinematography and um, those sweeping 
cinematic, spectacular landscapes to make that um, that story come to life on screen. West Side Story also has some really cool cinematography uh, as well. It's very like kinetic camera work to capture all the dancing and action that's going on screen. Um, so those are um, two uh, very big contenders. So I, I'm curious. Uh, either way, we'll, we'll see uh, who ends up winning. We'll see what happens at Oscar night on uh, Sunday evening. And uh, regardless of who wins, there's movie history being made with every iteration of Oscar night. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you, Annette Bohenick, for being our guest this week on And I Quote. We really, really appreciate it. My goodness gracious, if you have not learned something new today, I don't know what to tell you. But with that being said, Annette, where can the person watching or listening to this find you on social media and everything that you have coming up? What do you got? Yeah, I think, well, uh, the, the main thing is the blog. So that's hometowns to hollywood.com just spelled out all those words, hometowns to hollywood.com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter as at home and the number two Hollywood. Uh, so at home to Hollywood. Uh, and I'm also uh, on Facebook, there is a hometowns to Hollywood Facebook page. So you could also um, see uh, what I am posting, uh, what, what my new articles are, you could learn about uh, my Patreon as well. And uh, any of uh, my upcoming Upcoming, uh, writing releases too. Uh, with that being said, to my uh, my book, the Hometowns to Hollywood Volume One uh, iteration is on Amazon at this point. It's available in ebook, paperback, and hardcover form. And uh, as mentioned, I am also on Patreon. So if you support artists on Patreon, uh, you can look for me there uh, under Hometowns to Hollywood and see different benefit tiers and levels there. Um, I have some fun giveaways. There are pins, tote bags, and uh, also the opportunity for um, for you to suggest a film or a certain star that I research uh, and, uh, and include that as a new article on Hometowns to Hollywood, uh, the, the blog. Uh, so any of those platforms work. I tend to cross post what I put on Facebook onto Twitter. Uh, so um, you, you'll, you should be able to access my work from any of those platforms. Ah, excellent. Thank you so much for that, Annette. And by the way, all the links to where you can find Annette Bohannick, everything uh, that's coming up are located within the description of this video. So make sure you check that out there to keep up to date with all the incredible things that Annette Bohannick is doing. She is respecting the past, embracing the future. But the most important thing here is, ladies and gentlemen, learn your film history because <laughs> it is an amazing world with so many incredible stories. So maybe some things you may have had the chance to learn about before. You never know. Anything is possible. Once again, my name is Ryan of Neuroculture. You can find me and everything that we're doing here on all forms of social media, simply at It's Neuroculture. If you want to follow me individually, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at RyanRPM5. That's the best way to find me and get in touch with me and all that great stuff. Once again, thank you so much for your support. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, smash that notification bell so you're notified when new videos go up. And all that jazz, once again, and I quote is on Saturdays at 12 p.m. EST, so you're not going to want to miss that. We have a lot of great episodes and a lot of great events planned for you coming up in the very near future. So to you, thank you for being here, and stay healthy, stay strong, stay safe, learn your film history, support indie writers, indie artists, indie creators, support small businesses, all shapes and sizes, because a rising tide does indeed lift all ships and also there are a couple of other great things going on so make sure you support those and those indie artists and creators as well and also one more thing and annette you may agree with me on this mm -hmm. life is better when reading take a look famous faces and funnies in melbourne florida is leading the way in pop culture fun from comic books and graphic novels to funko pops and collector's items famous faces and funnies has it all rick shea and the professional team at famous faces and funnies are friendly and knowledgeable whether you're looking for toys props collector treasures or a new comic book famous faces and funnies is your one-stop shop to find famous faces and funnies on facebook and twitter just type at fff comics in the summer of 1953, private investigator Will Lucky Marks was working as the in-house private eye for Arcane Pacific Pictures. Trapped inside the studio with the killer, Lucky must find the killer before time runs out. Lot 28. Own it today. Available iTunes and Amazon.com. Ch 
choose high flying action. Choose death defying escapes. Choose spine tingling thrills. Choose nail biting intrigue. Now's your chance to choose the adventure. The Captain Hawkland Adventures. Available on Amazon.com. The original intention of the film was just for my personal use, but I thought with it being such a unique thing that I'd like to offer it to anybody who wants to see it. Uh, on the first visit, Jack took us into his uh, another room, a separate room, and there were these brown parcels full of artwork piled up. And he said to me, you draw like I do. We were in the studio for five hours you know it, it was fantastic and there's this he's got this desk and everything he's ever drawn has come from this desk and then it, and then i would just let just go with the flow and that's that's what this film is about it's, and it's just a unique film of him he says i beat you he says they say we came in under the dead of heat he says that's not true because i beat you and the Americans said, well, he says, if you like to think so, he says, but I know a real story, he says, I, he says, I, I know I clearly won that one. See? See? Well, Joe was six foot three, and I was a run, see, from the Lower East Side. And uh, being Joe's partner was an advantage to me because uh, Joe was believable, you know, they, they would talk to Joe. And, uh, the Goodman brothers would get to know him. Martin Goodman loved Marvel at that time. Uh, he went to his mother and he says, Look, Jackie got a job drawing. He says, They're paying him part. They're paying him money for drawing. He says, Suppose I go with Jackie. He says, And uh, he said, They'll pay me money. He says, I'll draw and they'll pay me money. He said, I'll give the money to you. Which he did. He gave it all to our mothers. They called me from NASA. You know, I lived in Long Island. And they say, uh, would you like to come down and draw these guys in training? I swear, this is not a story. And I, I said, yes, of course, I'd, I'd love to come down. I, 